Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Gibson's Bookstore. We are very pleased to see you all here tonight as you all came out to support one of our local hometown authors. We are very pleased to have him present tonight the Concord Theater and Concord's love affair with the movies. Please join me in welcoming Paul Brogan. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's, it's nice to be here, and it's nice to see all of you, and it's nice to be here uh, talking about my book, which uh, has really been in the works for about 50 years since I started working at the Concord Theater so, so many years ago. Um, in fact, I started working at the Concord Theater the same year that the gentleman who wrote my foreword for the book uh, opened Cinema 93. And I do want to acknowledge Barry Steelman, who's here tonight, and thank him for writing the poem and all of his work. And I have a copy of the book for you with me. Um, but uh, it was uh, an amazing experience for me. I loved uh, being there, and uh, I loved the experiences that I had learning about how movies are booked and uh, what happens before you get a movie. I had no idea beforehand. I thought somebody just picked up the phone and said, I think I'd like to play this movie or that movie. But it was an entirely different and a new process. Uh, and Teresa was very eager uh, to share her experiences going back to 1933, when she was 19 years old and the uh, theater first opened. And uh, she was there until the last film, which was in 1994, and it was Andre, the story of the little girl in Maine and the seal that would return every year. And that was the, the last picture show. But she treated me like a contemporary, and uh, I never felt like a teenager, and, and we had wonderful adventures together. I'm going to read about our, our first X-rated movie we went to together. Uh, I read a part of the, the book. Um, but she just loved movies. And this book is her story, but it's also a story of uh, Concord, uh, the changing times, the theaters that people went to, the Concord Drive-In, the Sky High Drive, and also known as the Passion Pit, um, <laughs> up in Boston, and a lot about Cinema 93. And Cinema 93 and the Concord Theater had a great deal in common because they were both run and owned by individuals who did not look at strictly how much money can I make on this film and what's in it, you know, in that respect. But they truly both shared a belief that they had an obligation and a responsibility to make it possible for the people in Concord to be able to see a variety of movies and films and not just the typical kind of film that, that uh, Hollywood will sometimes turn out. I often say during the talks that I've given recently with Joe Gleason from the Capital Center for the Arts, who's here tonight, um, that um, you can go to the Regal Cinema, for instance, four times in four weeks, and chances are a different person will sell you your ticket, a different person will sell you your concession, a different person will help you take a second mortgage to afford the concession. <laughs> and, um, you know, there is no real connection uh, that you make uh, as you made with the independent theaters. And the Concord Theater, Teresa was the face that you usually saw. She once said she felt like a human pinata after playing an especially bad movie because almost everyone stopped on the way out to tell her how disgusting the film was, how bad it was, that she should be ashamed of herself for having shown it. And Cinema 93 was the same way. Barry Steelman was the face of Cinema 93. And you knew that you could talk to him about uh, the picture, you could talk to him about something you'd heard that was playing maybe at the Exeter Street Theater in Boston, wondering whether it might be coming up here to Concord. And for many, you know, it wasn't necessarily Cinema 93 or C93, you'd say, I'm going over to Barry's to see such and such a movie. And it's that kind of 
personality that we don't have today, and it is sadly missed, with the exception of Red River, because Red River carries on the independent movie theaters being an important part of our community. And that goes back to 1912, when the first independent movie theater, a theater specifically as a movie theater, opened on School Street. And Jacob Kahn opened Kahn's Theater on the site of now the garage. But when I was growing up, it was the uh, American Legion Hall. And that was Kahn's Theater for many years. And that was uh, an individual who ran that. And then for many years, of course, we had both the Concord and Cinema 93, and we had two independent theaters here in town. And that was something that most cities in New Hampshire didn't have. So we had a plethora of wonderful films that we got to see, thanks to these two individuals uh, and their love for motion pictures, which uh, was translated to everybody who walked through the door of either one of those theaters. So I hope the book captures both of their stories, and I hope it also captures a time, uh, you know, in, in Concord when the movies really matter too as a form of entertainment, because uh, it was next to radio, it was the most inexpensive way to go to the movies. An interesting statistic that I note in the book: in the year 1946, the year after the war ended. Uh, when everyone was coming home and people were trying to return to a normal life, the movies in Concord sold almost one million tickets. Wow. And that was the three downtown theaters, the Capitol Theater, the Capitol Center for the Arts, the Star Theater on uh, Pleasant Street, where White Mountain Coffee is now, and where Barry moved to Cinema 93 video <coughs> for a while, and then the Concord Theater. The three theaters combined sold just under a million tickets during that year. So movies contributed to the economy of the community and brought people together, especially in times of fear and want during the Great Depression when uh, people didn't have a lot of money, but for 10 cents you could go and see the latest serial at one of the theaters. Uh, or during the war when your loved ones you had a loved one that was off fighting, you got to go to the movies, and you got to escape, and you got to forget for a little while. So um, I hope that this you know, book brings to life that era, which is really gone now. In the era of multiplex cinemas, it is totally different. Just, and, and again, you, you pay so much now, and you don't get the personal touch that, that really made going to the movies a community experience. So, um, so this uh, book, uh, I spent 1,835 hours writing <laughs> and, um, but, and, and researching. And I owe a lot to the Concord Public Library and a lot to you know, other archives, Box Office Magazine and some of the others for providing all kinds of information. And just uh, observing as everything, you know, the uh, experience of, of being at the Concord Theater. I worked there for about eight years on a regular basis, and then I stayed until 1994, helping out on weekends with uh, crowds when there were crowds, or helping to uh, tell mm -hmm. Teresa that the movie that nobody showed up for wasn't worth worrying about. Um, but uh, it, it was just a real wonderful opportunity in a town where we had so many family-run businesses. I mean, Aussie Waite, the Concord Camera Store, the Levin Sailors ran, Brown and Saltmarsh, and uh, Eddie Fine, and so many businesses that were family-owned. And downtown was bustling, and on Friday nights, uh, traffic was you know backed up as though we were New York City or something, <laughs> because um, everyone came downtown both to shop and to just see their friends and their neighbors and to you know connect with other people in the community and to support the businesses that were owned by the people they knew uh, from church or school or you know anything else. So um, I hope that the book does. Uh, either bring memories for those of us who were around to see that and be a part of it, and for those who weren't, let them have some insight into what the city was like. Um, 
it, you know, we, we talk sometimes about Concord City in a coma, but uh, it really wasn't uh, most of the time. Not when you had, um, in 1968, when we played Valley of the Dolls, which streets are called Valley of the Dollars. Um, it sold more than 15,000 tickets during its run. And we had lines up to State Street waiting to get in, standing out in the cold. And uh, it was an amazing, you know, experience for me because I had to stay until two in the morning and clean up from all the popcorn and the soda bottles that were snuck in and everything else and still be at Bishop Brady High School at uh, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. But the adrenaline was such and the fun and the experience of, of seeing all those people and, and, and how breathless they were when they came in because they thought they were going to see something extraordinary and how defeated they seemed on their way out. <laughs> Especially those that had read the book and were imagining how some of those scenes were going to be presented. It was much like what had happened a decade earlier with Peyton Place and people, you know, thought they were going to see all of these things. But anyway, um, but before I read a little bit from the book and then take some questions, um, I do want to acknowledge a few of the people that are here. Again, I acknowledge Barry for his invaluable part in our community. And I want to acknowledge Nikki Clark, the Executive Director of Capital Center for the Arts, and Joe Gleason, the Assistant, and Len Savian, because they have been working as part of a team for over a year now in bringing the Concord Theater back to life as the Bank of New Hampshire stage. And it will be opening next month. The ribbon cutting is June 19th, I believe. And uh, it will be wonderful. And I think Teresa would be thrilled because in 1933, when her father, a building contractor, was converting the Norris Bakery into the Concord Theater, uh, it was a new era. For s some 70 years, it had been a popular spot for people in Concord to buy their baked goods. And it was now being converted into another use as a movie theater. And now it's being converted into the Bank of New Hampshire stage, where people will continue to come and see shows and be entertained and connect with one another as part of the community. And I think that that's... Uh, an amazing uh, opportunity for Concord and it also speaks for our community and the fact that as happened with the City Auditorium, with Red River Theatres, with the Capital Center for the Arts, we have a passion for the arts and for making a difference and for keeping parts of our history alive even if they take on somewhat of a new form and so it's a very exciting time for our community. And I think I saw Angie Lane here somewhere, um, and she's the executive director of Red River Theaters. And if you've not been to Red River, you need to check it out because she's continuing that tradition of the independent theater. And, uh, and she's there, the people that you see there are people, including Mr. Steelman, who are a part of our community and are there because they love what they're doing. What I'm going to read from the book is um, a part about the X-rated movie Teresa and I went to see, and I need to put it into some kind of context first. Uh, Valley of the Dolls was one of those benchmark films when we played it. Uh, it was not only condemned by the Catholic Church and the Legion of Decency. In those days, we didn't have movie ratings, PG and you know all of that. So it was the Legion of Decency that rated these films. Um, and that was rated X, which meant that a Catholic in attendance was uh, in, had occasion for committing mortal sin. Um, and I was at Bishop Brady, and I was, Father Limoges called me into the office to express his concern that I was going to be working during the run of an X-rated movie and how that would reflect upon me. And he told me that I had to go to confession every Saturday and confess uh, at St. Peter's, which was our church. And uh, so 
if I died in between, I would go to hell. So, dutifully, every Saturday afternoon, I went to St. Peter's and did the Bless Me Father for I have sinned. It's been one week since my last confession. Uh, I have been uh, in attendance at Valley of the Dolls 14 times. <laughs> well, one week, the person in the confessional was Father Goodwin, who was a teacher at Brady, and knew me. And recognized my wife. So I did the usual. I said, I've been in attendance at Valley of the Dolls 14 times this week. And he said, uh, what performances? I said, two evening shows at 6.30 and 8.30. And he paused, and then he said, are there no matinee performances? <laughs> <laughs> so it was... Um, anyway, it was very controversial, but the number of tickets that were sold made you know everybody... Uh, Every studio then tell their salesperson, because every studio had a salesperson, generally out of the Boston office, who would call up and try to sell you know, this picture as the best movie you'll ever play and all of this. And uh, there was a movie called Candy, which uh, was from Cinerama Releasing Company. And the salesman was so eager to sell the picture that, oh, Teresa, you'll make more than Valley of the Dolls, and blah, 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 and all of this other. And uh, she, by that point, had heard that from so many people that she was a little bit incredulous as to, you know, I don't know about that. But I'm going to read the part about what we did as a, as a way of... of One title that did not play the Concord was Candy. Based on a very popular 1958 book written by Terry Southern, Candy was being released by a relatively new company, Cinerama Releasing. The salesman was likable enough, but he seemed to be trying too hard in telling Teresa she would make more money than she had with Valley of the Dolls if she would book his film. On a Friday afternoon, he called her just before five and told her he needed to know on Monday morning whether she would agree to the terms of the contract. Sunday morning after attending the 11 o'clock mass, <laughs> Teresa called me at home and invited me to attend the afternoon showing of Candy in Manchester <coughs> at the Rex Theater. Because of the book's reputation as well as the reviews for the film, I didn't tell my parents what we were going to see, <laughs> only noting that Teresa needed my help or something. <laughs> the Rex Theater was a small but unique movie house located on Amherst Street, a few buildings down from the office of the Manchester Union Leader, the state's largest newspaper. William Loeb, who had made no secret of his disdain for the kind of film Hollywood was producing, had, if anything, grown even more angry since the days of Jack the Ripper earlier in the decade. I was surprised that Candy was playing so close to the paper's office and expected thunderbolts to come hurtling down from Amherst and strike the Rex. I had never been to the Rex Theater and was surprised and delighted with the stadium seating the theater had. Today it's commonplace, but when the Rex opened, and still in the late 1960s, it was innovative. As we entered, I was delighted at the reality of there not being a single bad seat in the theater. A quick look around seemed to indicate I was the youngest person in the theater. <laughs> The Motion Picture Association of America rating system had only recently begun in November of 1968. Candy was one of the first films to receive an X rating. This was especially surprising at the time since the movie boasted a cast that included Richard Burton, Marlon Brando, and Ringo Starr. As we sat there waiting for the film to start, I self-consciously pulled my nip knit cap down further over my head and pulled up my turtleneck sweater. Candy was and is a debacle and an embarrassment to all involved in its production. As confused as I might have been in a film like Boom the summer before, we'd gone to see a movie called Boom with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton um, in Burlington, Mass, uh, at the prospect of playing it, which we did. But by the second day, we called it Bomb. It was a confusing, strange movie, beautifully set on an island of Sardinia, with great scenery, but it made no sense. It was one of the worst Tennessee Williams uh, adaptations, I think, of all time. But Candy just left me feeling very uncomfortable and grateful that we'd not had to pay to see it. 
The salesman from Cinerama Releasing had arranged for us to see it for free. I didn't dare turn to see Teresa's response to what we were witnessing. <laughs> You know, Teresa's in her late 50s at the time, mm -hmm. and I'm sure she was seeing things that she'd never seen before. <laughs> she went to school in a convent, had, had considered becoming a nun when she was very young. Um, uh, Fifteen minutes into the film, I noticed some activity out of the corner of my eye and turned to see what was happening. Teresa had reached into her pocket and taken out her rosary beads. <laughs> She was beginning to silently say her rosary. At that instant, I knew that Candy would never play. <laughs> Over lunch at Angelo's, a restaurant in Hanover Street, we talked about everything but the movie, and afterwards stopped briefly at her home to retrieve some items. She no longer spent extended periods of time at the house since her theater duties required her presence into the wee hour. The upper two floors of her two decker, triple decker in Manchester were rented, and the first floor, which had been her home, was regularly cleaned and maintained. Monday morning, shortly after 9, Teresa placed a call to the salesman at Cinerama releasing and told him, quote, Your film isn't fit to occupy the dumpster outside my theater. <laughs> <laughs> You know, she, she just had, you know, a certain standard about it, and she wasn't going to uh, play something that she was so, you know, offended by, you know, as, as she was by, by that film. Um, she had already been thrown out of St. John's Church because she played Valley of the Dolls and refused to cancel the film. And so uh, the Monsignor had said, you're not ever to walk in our door again. So she started going to Sacred Heart Church on Pleasant, where she continued, and they were very thrilled to have her $50 a week collection. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, I don't want to, you know, give away too much, and I promised Joe Gleason that I wouldn't repeat any of the stories he has heard during all of our numerous speeches <laughs> and talks. Candy one was new. I haven't heard Oh, good. <laughs> Um, but uh, I would take questions and hopefully have some answers for you uh, if anyone has a question or is curious. In the book, I do, uh, I, in the back, I list some of the movies that were the most popular that played there in different categories, musicals, comedies, horror films, sci-fi, teen, John Wayne, romance, action, John Wayne, uh, My Name is Bond, dramas and family films. And I think some will probably stir you know, all kinds of, of memories for you. I do remember when we played Woodstock, which was the most popular musical we played, even more so than Grease, which was in second wow. place. Um, we had great concerns from Elsie Campbell next door at the Friendly Club. Uh, she would check out what we were playing because uh, the girls that lived there uh, needed to be protected from some of the less than uh, wholesome films. And I remember the night uh, there was an alleyway between the theater and the friendly club, a driveway sort of thing. She excitedly came over and said to Teresa, there are people smoking outside in the alley and they're not smoking Marlboros. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway. Um, so I would welcome anybody with a uh, question. Yes? Oh, I thought there were two sisters that ran the concert theater. There were uh, always two ladies. Well, there. yes, it was a family. It was the uh, Canton family. Uh, their father, Wenceslas Canton, was the contractor and the business partner of Mr. Charbonneau, who originally opened the theater. Uh, and there were the sisters, uh, Teresa, uh, then there was Rena, who married a constant uh, in town, Jos Joseph Leo Constant, who worked at Concord Group. Then there was another sister, Lori, uh, and Lori worked um, for uh, Grapponi for a while, and then later on she worked uh, for the state of New Hampshire. And then there was a brother, Morris Canton, who lived over on Tremont Street. But um, Teresa, it was the Concord Theater Corporation, Teresa was the president, she did the uh, she sold the tickets, uh, often sold, she made the popcorn. 
because they didn't know how to add the right amount of this and that to make it right. Um, she booked the movie, she made the ads uh, for the Concord Monitor, she did the bookkeeping, she did all of that, um, and made sure that uh, they knew it. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, she, they worked for her, and Morris, her brother, was a union projectionist and would work sometimes up in the projection room. So it was a, a family operation, but Teresa really was the one that made the ultimate decisions and did the research as to what pictures might be, you know, good to play, and went off and usually saw them um, and, and made the decision based based on that sometimes. Yes? Why could they show Valley of the Dolls, which was kind of salacious, but Candy she didn't like, but she allowed... Was, was it just poor acting, or was it a little more risque? Um, candy was just trashy bad. Um, <laughs> no you know, art to it. No art to it. Right. Seduction. And, yes. and all the good parts of the book were left out. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, no, it's, um, Candy was just awful. I mean, yeah. just, just not even fun trash. Yeah. It was just vile, and and um, and the re and she was noting also the response of the other people in the rec <coughs> theater that day, and she listened to some of the remarks on the way out, and um, that was part of a chain, the Shea Circuit in Manchester, owned uh, managed by a Mr. Hickey, and Mr. Hickey was in the lobby that day, and people were screaming at him about they wanted their money back and everything else. And she decided, based upon everything, that this was not something that uh, we were going to play. Yes? Paul, had she previewed Valley of the Dolls? No, because when they made the deal for it, uh, the movie hadn't even been completed. Judy Garland had just been fired, and they'd replaced uh, her with Susan Hayward. And so um, she was basing it on my recommendation because I'd read the book, but I didn't admit it to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I thought, oh, and I told her that this one is based on this character, is based on this person, and this one, and this one. And at the time, it was being compared to Peyton Place as far as appeal. And Peyton Place had played the Capitol Theater to tremendous business. Mm -hmm. And so she took it on my recommendation and made so much on it that, as, as a result, she started each year uh, to say thank you, taking me to Boston when the Met would tour at the War Memorial Auditorium each year. And she'd always say, what opera would you like to see this year? And so for three or four years, we would do that. And she'd always say, this is because of Valley of the Dolls. <laughs> and a follow-up to that, how many times did you see uh, Father Limoges in disguise sneaking into the <laughs> <laughs> Um We did catch, I believe it was Monsignor Murray from St. John's, <laughs> the one that had told her she couldn't, I think it was him, or Buckley, one or the other. And he came in, and Teresa, and he wasn't in his priest garb, but, and he tried to, but she recognized him, and, um, and she looked up at him and said, thank you, Father, and he looked notably embarrassed and hurried inside. <laughs> but, yes. Yes? Um, Valley of the Dolls was a great yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it really was more exciting. And what was that like to, you know, spend that exciting time at the theater and then have to go back and <laughs> Well, I think it, it, um, it, it's, good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I loved Brady. I mean, I actually donated a copy of the book the other day. I went up to Brady on Monday and donated a copy to their library. Um, and I don't know. Um, Everybody was extra nice to me after I got that job because they were hoping that they could get free tickets. Um, and, um, and the nuns loved it because Teresa would do special screenings for the nuns on a Saturday afternoon if it was something, not Valley of the Dolls, yeah. but I mean, something like Camelot and yeah. Thoroughly Modern Millie and some of those kinds of films. And so 
uh, they tended to treat you with kid gloves, more or less, I think, as a, as a result. Even though, when you look at it, and I, noticed, I note this in the book, the, the actual story of Thoroughly Modern Millie is the story of a woman running a boarding house in New York for young single girls, and the girls who don't have any family get thrown in the back of a laundry basket and taken off to be sold as white slaves in an opium den. And, but because Julie Andrews was in it, and Mary Tyler Moore, people overlooked that and just came to see it and thought, oh, what a wholesome, wonderful, you know, film this is. So, yes. And the nuns were loving it. They were applauding the musical numbers. So. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, Margaret. The, the book is wonderful. I enjoyed it so much. I finished it last night. So Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Whatever possessed you to record how many hours it took you to record? <laughs> <laughs> well, initially I thought, I wonder how, how, you know, I just started casually, occasionally jotting down things until it reached the first hundred uh, hours. Uh, that I'd go to the library and spend time going back to get the exact date, for instance, at something. I mean, I knew, for instance, that the Christmas picture in 1968 was Camelot, but going and checking to see uh, what date it opened and different things like that, and then I'd get lost down there for two hours going through, oh, I remember that one, and I remember that <laughs> one. Uh, so then I started to more seriously keep track of the number of hours. Uh, that was taking to uh, do that and then to write a chapter and then to come back the next day and hate what I wrote and <laughs> say, that's too, uh, and, um, but uh, I just, I, I think curiosity, because I didn't keep track the last time, uh, and I, I uh, it just seemed like it had taken up decades writing that, and I thought, you know, can I do this? Once I seriously decided that I was going to do it, uh, and which was a little under two years ago, that I said, finally, I've got to do this. And it was after the theater had been saved and everything else that I realized uh, I'd like people to know when they go in there, because it's still going to have in the tile as you walk in, Concord Theater that oh, had okay. been there for all of those years. So there's a piece of of that that will still be there. And I said, maybe people will wonder, what was Comfort Theater? Uh, and so I wanted, I want to tell them what it was and um, in a way that maybe they'll laugh or cry or, or you know, be moved or something like that. And Teresa never got an enormous amount of respect from a lot of people. A lot of people, oh, the crazy lady that runs the theater. <laughs> and different things that, you know, spring up uh, through the years. And so um, I thought it would be nice for, uh, for that to uh, be on the record. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Mr. Weber? Yes. Yeah. Um, Teresa seems to have been a fan of movies in addition to being a, a businesswoman. Um, did she have favorite actors, and did her uh, love of favorite actors influence her choice of motion pictures? Um, in some respects. Now, we, in 1968, we played the anniversary with Betty Davis, and a few years later, a horrible movie called Bunny O'Hare with Betty Davis as a bank <laughs> robber with Ernest Borgnine, solely because Teresa had enjoyed <laughs> Betty Davis as an actress years earlier. Um, we played Berserk with Joan Crawford because Teresa loved Joan Crawford. She did put her foot down about Trog. She refused to play Trog. <laughs> but um, she, uh, there were times that, um, and there were directors she liked. She liked um, Stanley Kubrick after we played 2001. She liked his cinematic style. And so when the opportunity came to play Barry Lyndon, um, she jumped at that chance because it was Stanley Kubrick, and the same with The Shining, because it was directed by him. And uh, Polyester was a movie she went to see. And um, we had nobody show up one night at the movies, not a single soul. And Teresa said, well, what are we going to do? 
And I said, I don't know, do you want to go someplace to the movies? I said, uh, and she said, what's Barry playing? And I explained. I said, it's called Polyester, it's by uh, John Waters, and I said, it's in Odorama. And she said, what's Odorama? I said, you get a little scratch and sniff card when you walk in, and you scratch when the number comes up on the screen. And she said, that sounds like fun, let's go. <laughs> so we went over. Um, and she did, and she went there occasionally. Uh, La Caja Fall, the original in the, in the French, she came to see twice because she thought it was the funniest thing. She laughed till she cried at it. But anyway, we went to polyester and we did the whole scratch and sniff. Um, and all, and after which she said to me, now that big woman in that, um, is, she, is she been in other pictures? And I explained to her that that wasn't a woman. And, and she said, well, my eyesight must be fading because that looked like a woman. Um, so a few years later, when Divine starred in Hairspray, she tried to get it but wasn't able to. But one of the last movies we played was Serial Mom, a John Waters film, in the summer of 94 with Kathleen Turner, Sam Waterston, and Ricky Lake. And she booked it because the salesman said, this is John Waters' new movie. And she remembered back to going to the Scratch and Sniff movie and said, well, then I'll book it. So, um, so she found that interesting. Um, uh, she loved Garbo, but of course Garbo never played there. It always played the Capitol Theater because uh, Maine, New Hampshire theaters got most of the Metro titles and things like that. But uh, Joan Crawford was one of her favorite actresses. And in um, 1975, I was able to get her Joan's um, autograph, which she framed and she had upstairs on her bed table till the day she died. So. Yes? Do you have a favorite movie from all of these times? <laughs> Sorry. No. Uh, I don't know if you've ever. Oh. That's okay. I don't know. I mean, some of them I loved the first time, but after seven or eight or nine years, <laughs> And they did play. I mean, that was the thing. A movie like Animal House or Tin played for nine weeks. And I think Barry can identify with that because he had dances with wolves oh, for three or four months. years. <laughs> I mean, you had to, you know, you had to play movies for a long time uh, in order to get them because running time and terms and, you know, the first week often it got to the point where the studio took 90% uh, of everything that came in. That's why concession becomes important because you have you make your money on that. Uh, yes. Oh yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> first of all, I want to say Teresa was very fortunate. Have you by her side all the time? Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are so fortunate. Did you, were you able to uh, obtain any mementos or something from their construction or reconstruction of the new theater? Any mm -hmm. discoveries of any kind? No, no, I didn't. But, but Joe took me in a couple of times and I got to walk around and, um, and it, it was just, I mean, it still felt, that first time that we went there, it's still the steps going upstairs. I remember I used to have to lug the film cans up to the projection booth and take the other ones down so National Screen could come mysteriously in the middle of the night and take the old film away and leave the new one. And, uh, and the steps sounded exactly the same. There was still that squishy one that you often thought, oh my God, someday this is gonna rot away and my foot will go through. But, um, but uh, no, and I don't know what happened to the horrible ladder that you, you, they used to uh, change the marquee. Uh, when I started there, the thing was dangerous. And I went up once, and I refused to ever go up again. And we found an unfortunate sucker, a uh, person <laughs> who was willing to, for a couple of dollars, free popcorn and a free ticket to a movie, go up there and change, and change the sign. So, um, yes, I stand there.
did the graduate play at the Concord Theater? Nope, Cinema 93. Cinema, okay. Yes. I couldn't they were remember playing, which one it was. They were playing the graduate at the same time we were playing Valley of the Dogs. Oh, oh, I, know. I went to the graduate. <laughs> and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner was playing at the same time at the Capitol. So there were three. Three great movies. Yeah. Well, well two great. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, but anyone, yes? Um, I, I think I'm right that um, Capitol Theater was considered for Red River. Is that true? No. Concord Theater. Concord Theater, yeah. rather. Yes, yes. Barry, in, in 2000, right? You were in the early. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. And oh, the, they looked at it for several years. And what was the reason that? Uh, it turned into a situation where they felt it was going to be more money than they could raise in order to do the conversion. Mm -hmm. So the, was there ever any other interest in the building through the Not years? really. It would have been very hard to configure it into a multi-screen cinema because of the way that, it, you know, it was, it had 499 <coughs> seats and it was, you know, set in, in such, Away, there were there were 25 rows, two sections, uh, with 10 seats in each row, except for the one row that only had nine seats. Because if you had under 500 seats, you paid less on your insurance. And the theater had 500 seats. And Teresa was talking to her insurance man. He said, you know, if you had under 500, it would be a lot less expensive. So an hour later, she called back, and one seat had vanished. <laughs> so there were now 499 seats. <coughs> and her insurance went down markedly you know, as a result. But it would have been incredibly difficult. Because it was very old, and it would have needed probably two or three million dollars in work. And there wouldn't have been a way to have the multi-screen, which you sort of have to have today, because you can't really run a movie weeks and weeks and weeks and continue to make money on, when, on weeknights. You know, a movie like Animal House would sell out on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but Monday through Thursday, there might only be 40, 50, 60 people coming. And so it gets, but the terms of the contract are that you run it for X number of weeks, and so you have to keep it, and so it's, it. Thank you, Capital Center, for keeping it for us. Yeah. It was much more than two to three million. <laughs> 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 yes. I think the last film I saw at the theater was The Crying Game. Yes. And that was quite controversial oh, at the time. Yeah. Yes. yes. And um, I'm wondering if you have any um, impressions or thoughts about what that process was, how she decided to book that film. And um, she read everything she could about it and talked to uh, both the salesman and a couple of other theaters owners that had played it elsewhere. And they said, audiences absolutely love it, uh, are just coming away. And so um, she decided to do it. And that was about the last sellouts that she actually, a couple of nights, had to pull out the sold out sign and put it on the, the door, mm -hmm. which, which about a year or so before it closed, I think. That, that, that that play, yeah. and uh, so something like that. She, um, you know, yeah. thought that that far away. And in the 70s, she took a chance on a couple of films by the filmmaker Lena Wertmuller before she became, uh, you know, and she played Swept Away and Seven Beauties. And there was a lot of flack about that. But again, people that did <coughs> see it absolutely loved it. And it was a little cutting edge away from what typically we were, you know, showing at the time. Anyone else? Yes. I, just, the, I, the, I came over from California and my aunt wanted to go see The Last Emperor. Mm -hmm. and, and yes. That, and I could just remember sitting there, it was winter, mm -hmm. and it was hot and we went in, and the movie was a long movie. Yes. And then the heat was going, going and going. And going. And by the end of the movie, you had to have boots on, because yes. it was cold. <laughs> Yes, the minute the second show started, that heat went off. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. 
I mean, that was 88 we that play. Right after broadcast news, Moonstruck, and then the last improv. Those were the three that played in a row. Moonstruck was next to Valley of the Dolls. That more tickets were sold for that, and that was actually a good film. Yeah. And I still watch it when it comes out. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Yes. As the parent of a <coughs> teenage boy working in the theater, <laughs> knowing that some of the things that he was going to see were really not what his father and I thought was quite the thing. <laughs> because it was Teresa, it was all right. <laughs> yes. 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 We had just decided that whatever she plays, it'll be all right. And she was just a good, good woman doing a good job. For a and good my kid. and my mother would make Christmas cookies at Christmas time and always send a big package down to the theater. And Teresa would not share them with any of her sisters. <laughs> they went into her desk drawer in the manager's office. And when she was in there doing her bookkeeping and everything, she would help herself to a cookie and make them last probably until the end of January. <laughs> but, all right, yes. Oh, just one last question. And yes. I just want to get into your head about this. Mm -hmm. In getting ready and writing this book, did you prefer the research or the actual writing? Or yeah. was it like a combo? Well, but to an extent it was a combo, um, but the writing part uh, was the most fun. It was, it was. It, it, uh, it got easier as, as it went by and everything. Because so. some people love that research part. Mm. And, and that was fun, and it stirred a lot of memories and reminded me of a lot of things I had forgotten about. And that was where I found, during the research, found your dad in uh, one of the exhibitor magazines, oh, uh, where it was noting Johnny Nyan has moved from the Star Theater to the Concord Theater. <laughs> and so that reminded me of, of, of all those times that he and you would come to the theater years ago. And, and, um, and he never lost that connection. In fact, a couple of times when he, in his later years, Teresa said, now, when you retire, if you're looking for a job, I'll hire you back here. <laughs> she never forgot a good employee. So, yes. Um, we spoke earlier at the last showing of Andre there. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm Steve, by the way. Yes. And uh, I uh, wrote that article. Uh, about Andre being a very bizarre sign to stay on for like a year in the center of Concord. I was hoping for something a little racier. Uh, and uh, I, I, the story to that, I know you mentioned it, is that the, the Constance family, who I know, mm -hmm. were very upset at the article because mm -hmm. of the, I, had, I was like, why could you be upset? It was just like a mock, it was just something fun. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think they wanted that much attention to the to the sign. Okay. And so they had to talk with me after I wrote that article. I was like, well, but, you know, did you think it was funny? No, we didn't think it was funny. <laughs> well, it's included in the book. Yeah, so. that's great. There's just a funny <laughs> twist to it. <laughs> and, and it was more two of two that were upset as opposed Teresa didn't think it was such a big deal. No. Anyway, she had a sense of humor about <laughs> things like that. Um, all right. Yes. This is Bro. I think that your um, cover and the illustrations in it deserve a little mention. Oh. <laughs> well, I think. I thank all of the people associated with that, from Alan Jessamine, who uh, developed the concept way over there, and uh, Kirsty Walker at Hobblebush, and my publisher, George Gears, who I guess isn't here. He is. Oh, <laughs> sorry. hey, George. And George, because uh, when I approached him with this idea, he was very open to it. He was very enthused about it. And we met and talked a number of times, and um, he believed in it, and that is uh, really what 
propels and keeps an author going also is when uh, someone feels that the story they want to tell has merit and value, and that it's about far more than financial gain from it, but it's <coughs> telling a piece of our community. And George lived in Concord his whole life, went to the Concord Theater, knows a lot of local history, so um, it's, you know, uh, it's, it's a way for him also to give to the community a piece of the past and show how, how uh, you know, life was and how things are still relevant in many ways. So, thank you, George. <laughs> All right, well, I will be signing copies for anyone uh, right over there in a couple of minutes, and, um, and I thank everyone.